Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. Um, today we are live uh, with Philip Pilkington again. I am so excited that you were able to join us again for one of these segments. Um, I was reading over your CPI uh, write-up that you did a couple days ago, and uh, it's good to see that you don't think it'll be a big problem based on the cars and the rental prices, but I am curious to see your further work up on that. <laughs> How are you today? Not bad, not bad. So what led you to look into the CPI using those two um, equations, basically, like, like those two factors, like what made you look into those? Um, well, we were, when I was working my old job, we were pretty focused on inflation. The market's pretty obsessed with inflation, uh, has mm -hmm. been for the past while. Um, and I was concerned, uh, I, I, you know, there's, for the past few years, um, you know, for the past 10 years or so, I definitely haven't been in the inflation camp. I didn't think QE was going to cause inflation. I doubted that low interest rates were going to cause inflation. Um, and I always assumed that there was more of a deflationary um, uh, bias to the economy, um, mainly mainly because of a lot of structural problems in the economy. I think wealth inequality is a huge one. When when you have very serious wealth inequality, people save more. You know, there's more wealth accumulating and doing nothing at the top. And if that's not being spent into the economy, it, you can't really get much inflation. So so for a long time, I was I was very non-inflationist, but um, Immediately when the lockdowns happened last year, I became quite concerned about inflation because um, because inflation's you know people always knock around stuff like it's it's too much money chasing few gods and all this kind of thing and it's about central banks printing money and so, et cetera et cetera and some of the, there's some truth to a lot of these kind of theories but really when you see serious inflations it's usually when there's what what economists call a very large supply shock to the economy. Usually, these large supply shocks happen during war, um, and and usually they're twofold. They're um, uh, they're an interruption of the supply side of the economy because it's it's regeared to um, uh, supply war industry. Um, so a good example would have been uh, gasoline was rationed during World War II um, to be sent to the front. Uh, and a lot of goods were rationed in England in World War II. And the other problem is that you get rid of a lot of your labor force because they're all fighting. Um, young men in particular, who are usually a pretty core component of the labor force. So the lockdown looked to me like the first intervention that we'd seen definitely in the 20th century, in the 21st, um, that was of the same kind of size as a war mobilization. It was different, obviously, it was quite different. Um, but in terms of the level of interference in the economy, in the supply side and so on. So I, I got pretty concerned about it. Um, people weren't really talking. What was very striking about the pandemic when it started was that no one, all the economists became epidemiologists like overnight. They, they weren't really talking about the economy anymore. And I found that whole thing very strange. So I, I, tried, to stay, I, I, I tried to stay pretty focused on what was happening in the economy. And yeah, the the we did some work and and we kind of looked into the how the inflations worked uh, in in World War Two when they reopened the British economy after rationing and stuff, and we we saw that there was a um, that there was a reopening effect, as it were, um, that when you when you reopen things uh, and you've been interfering with them for a long time, prices can go a little a little haywire. So. I was kind of keeping an eye on it, and and um, an economist uh, called David Goldman was highlighting these private indices. This was earlier this year, I guess. He was highlighting this um, used car index, um, and I watched it at the time, and, and he ended up being right. He said there's going to be an inflation, it's going to be driven by used cars, and he was right. Um, the start of the recent increase in inflation, a large component of it was used cars. So I really started paying attention to what he was writing. And then recently, I think a week ago, he put out the Zillow rent index and said, this is going to be predictive too. Um, and so, you know, he got it right once. So, um, and his, his case was logical. So I thought, okay, well, well, maybe I can kind of systematize this and figure out the actual impacts. And so that's what I did. Um, and yeah, as you say, the, the impacts were, um, were, we're not dramatic. Now, step back, we're running close to 5% inflation. And what I found was that 
the increase in rent prices and the and the stopping increase in the used car prices balance each other out. So we're probably looking at continued five percent inflation, which is quite high. I, I wouldn't dismiss <laughs> that. Is, you know, oh yeah, that is uh, yeah, extremely so high. <laughs> it, it's quite high. It's quite high. So I wouldn't I wouldn't sniff at five percent inflation. Um, so th that's kind of what I found. The, the underlying thing, though, really. Um, I wrote an article on this, and I'm shopping it around a few newspapers to see if anyone will bite on it. But the real issue, I think, moving forward, because for, for an inflation to turn from a once-off price increase into a general inflation, wages have to start rising. It's, it's, there's almost no other way to get an inflation unless there's what rising wages. It, it doesn't. I'm not aware of any inflations that haven't been accompanied by rising wages. And um, that obviously, the main component of rising wages is how tight the labor market is and how much bargaining power workers have. Um, and worker bargaining power has been pretty flat since the 19, since around 1980. Um, and so again, that was one of the reasons I never really concerned much about inflation. But now something's changed. Um, there's, this, there's these labor uh, disruptions in the markets. Um, that everyone's talking about and everyone's kind of aware of it and and labor disruptions like that are going to give workers more bargaining power and there is a very good chance that this could get ingrained in wages and at that point it starts it could start to spiral i don't think into hyperinflation territory or anything but the you know you could go back to the 1970s looking at possibly double digit inflation um which wouldn't be good um but I think what I'm increasingly thinking is that people are wrong about the cause of this um, of this wage uh, um, pressure of this um, labor market market shortages. So the U.S. Um, uh, no offense to all of my American listeners, but the U.S. often when it looks at problems, um, they look at the problems of the U.S. as if there's nowhere else in the world. Um, and it's always it's always been quite you know I've worked in the U.S. You're not twice. Wrong. You're not no, wrong. it's true. It's, <laughs> and it's 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 kind of I'm like you know there's other countries in the world <laughs> they're they're quite similar to the U.S. in a lot of ways. Yes. You know? Um. And so it always kind of drives me nuts. Like even good economists and stuff, there's just a slight bias among Americans to think that to to think that um, America is kind of a a, a a a world unto itself, and it's not really. Um, and so what's what's happening is so the Americans this time around are telling themselves that um, that this is due to some welfare um, dynamics um, and and something to do with you know they sent out the checks the thousand dollar checks which I don't think were spent actually I think they went into into meme stocks I think I mean that's what it looks like but um, they uh, th there was that and then obviously the unemployment uh, has been fairly generous due to the pandemic and I'm like. So first of all, generous unemployment doesn't cause labor shortages like that. Europe has a much more generous welfare state than the U.S. And if it was true that generous welfare uh, payments um, caused it, then we'd constantly have labor shortages in, the, in, in Europe. And we don't. Actually, Europe has constant unemployment. It's the opposite. So welfare alone won't do it. Um, and... I, I and, and then the other problem was I looked into it and everywhere is experiencing these labor shortages. So France is experiencing them, Germany's experiencing them, and the United Kingdom's experiencing them. And so I looked into it and what we're so while the Americans are telling themselves that it's because they've fiddled with the welfare system, Britain, the British, are telling themselves that it's because of Brexit and we can't get immigrants from Europe to work. And then the Germans are saying it's something to do with immigration too, but they haven't had Brexit. So it's like everyone's kind of just it's one of those instances where you have a general trend and everyone's just kind of projecting their own national issue, whether it's welfare, whether it's immigration, whether it's Brexit, whatever. Right. But if you have something happening in multiple countries at once at the same time and it's unusual, then it probably has a single cause that all the countries share in common. And I think that cause is extremely obvious. It's COVID. It's the pandemic. And I think what's really happening here is that there's a certain portion of the population. It's a minority, but I think it's a sizable minority. And I reckon it's about five to 10 percent of people who are genuinely terrified of going back to work. I think they're scared. I think some people are, are so scared of the virus that they think if they go back to work, they're going to die. And I think that's what's causing the labor shortages. And if I'm right about that 
then you're not going to be able to fix the labor shortage problem by jiggling with the welfare system or by la making lax immigration uh, reform or whatever in the UK or whatever Germany and France are talking about. It's not going to work. If it's due to fear, then the only way to get those workers to go back is to make them less fearful. And that's really, that's probably hard, you know? I mean, I, I don't have any particular insight into that. I'll have to talk to psychologists, not economists. Um, so that's really striking. And then when I thought about it more, I realized that there's another huge problem coming down the, the, the line for, um, for the, the labor market. Uh, vaccines and vaccine mandates. Um, because I know, I, like, there's a certain popular portion of the population, it looks like about 10 or 15% in the US that doesn't want to take a vaccine, okay? And like, maybe people don't like that and like you can call them names or whatever, but look, facts are facts, right? These people really don't want to take the vaccine. It's come down, it was at about 25%. I looked at the numbers, it's at about 25%. It's come down to 15%. But my impression is the hardcore of people who don't want to get vaccinated really don't want to get vaccinated. And I don't think they'll be convinced. So if you bring in vaccine mandates into workplaces, you could lose more people. You see, no one's talking about this. It's absolutely crazy. So if you add up, if you add up, if I'm right, and the current disruptions are due to people who are extremely fearful of COVID, and then if the other potential disruption is people who are fearful of getting the vaccine, and it's funny because they're on the complete opposite ends of the pandemic politics spectrum, but if both these groups are, are, are alienated, you could be looking at a sizable portion of the workforce, like anywhere from 10 to 20% of the workforce. And if you lose 10 or 20% of the workforce, oh man, go, like good luck. We're gonna, the, the inflation's gonna get crazy. Philip, I'm gonna, uh, you made a lot of good points there. And it's actually amazing because I know you, you used to live here for a little bit and you're hitting it right on the head. So, um, I, I do want to, I'll back up to you, you know, the Americans not really looking at the global perspective. And that is something, you know, I, I since I was 18, I, I've always, you know, the, it's a small world. Um, I guess I was very fortunate in that aspect to realize that, that everything is connected to everything. Um, you know, we're connected to the UK, UK is connected to Australia, Australia is connected to China. Like, you have to understand how the world works in that, whether it's trade, whether it's, you know, visitation, visas, whatever it is, we're all connected. Um, and so that's where, that's why I do what I do. I love being able to open people up to the literal global market because, you know, people, I mean, before this year, I don't think people actually realized that Germany had a, a stock exchange. I don't think people realize that, the, you know, the Asian market or anything like that. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting to actually, you know, get people to understand, like, it's not just our stock exchange, you know, if, if, if the U.S. stock exchange goes down, there's other markets that they that people can go invest into, and um, we actually saw that with some of our hedge funds here, um, whether they were international or even domestic hedge funds that were invested into the stock exchange with the quote unquote meme stocks. Uh, the volatility that those have caused in our stock exchange and what's going on, those hedge funds pulled their money and went to the Asian uh, market. They're like, nope we're not touching the U S exchange right now because it is too wild. Um, so, and that, that's interesting to see that, you know, that, that actually made a headline and not really many people talked about it. Um, and then to onto the labor shortages. So I don't know if you've actually heard about this here. Um, there is a big movement in October, uh, for walkouts, not to go to work. Um, here, it's, I think it's worldwide, but I, I know a good portions for um, the U.S., but people are going to be walking out and demanding higher pay, better wage, uh, better work environments and health care and four day weeks and things like that. So there is um, that going on in October. And then the truckers, I don't know if you saw in Australia and then here in the States, and I don't know if it happened anywhere else in the world, um, but they... Um, kind of rallied together and said, we're not delivering. We're not going to go to work. Our, our transportation, they were like, no, sorry, we don't want the vaccine. We don't want the mandated vaccine and everything. And I think it, start, it started in Australia um, with their mandates. And, you know, they start, they're trying to do it here in the States. And our truckers are right there with them saying, no, we're not, you're not going to mandate this for us. And they didn't go to work.
Like they were like, nope, sorry, we're not delivering your goods and or anything today. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I've been following this stuff. It's absolutely, it's not. It's absolutely like, are people not thinking of the economic consequences of this? Did this, a more minor version of this is what happened in the 1970s. Unions went completely off the rails and started just striking about everything and making increasingly wild demands. And and that's what happened. And 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 everyone's forgetting that now. It's like it's like when you're listening to some people uh, talk about, for example, the just to focus on the vaccine mandate issue, they're talking about it as if workers have no power. And you're like, yeah, workers do have power because if they withhold their labor, the economy goes to crap, <laughs> and exactly. you get really bad inflation. Like. And I mean, I don't, I don't want to get into the politics of it because it's just a nightmare. But it, it's very ironic to me that it's, it's mainly the left making the assumption that workers have no power. It's like you're the entire historical left wing, uh, political thing was based on the fact that workers have power and can withhold their labor. And then they're, they're talking about implementing vaccine mandates or whatever and alienating ten to fifteen percent of the workforce, and you're like you don't think that's going to be massively disruptive? Like, so the whole thing is like, everything's topsy-turvy. It, it all stems from the same thing, which is what I was talking about, I noticed last year, that when the pandemic hit, everyone became an epidemiologist and all the economists just stopped talking about economics. And oh, you, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm just like, I get it. I, I get it. Like, like pandemic, it's serious, COVID, everything like that. But the thing is like, the epidemiologists need to focus on that. Everyone has to be at the table. You see what I mean? Like if, if you have a if you have a pandemic and you're considering they call it non pharmaceutical interventions and all this, then you need to you need to balance the pri the priorities. You see what I mean? So you need mm. to have input from epidemiologists. Sure, you need to have input from uh, specialists in vaccines, but you also need like you're talking about massive economic intervention. So you're probably going to want economists there as well. And and the, the ideal uh, the ideal approach to that should be hammered out with everyone at the table. But instead, it seemed that like everyone was at the table, but everyone became an ophthalmologist last year. And I think we're, we're, we're really the more I'm thinking about this labor market issue, the more I'm like, we're really playing with fire a little bit here. Like if if I'm in any way correct that 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 a portion of the current shortages are due to fear, and if further shortages are on the way, and you're saying it exactly, I mean it, it makes complete sense. You know we, what you're saying, like truckers, blah blah blah. Like this is what it will look like if that what? starts happening. You're talking. This would be, as far as I can see, this would be a lot worse than the 1970s because you're not just dealing because you're not just dealing with in the 1970s. I think it's fair to say the unions got greedy um, and then you're just dealing with greedy unions. So the, the way that you're going to deal with that is you convince them to be less greedy or you break the unions or you do whatever. Right. And there was a combination of all things done to stop the inflation of the 70s. But here you're dealing with much, much more fundamental issues. I mean, you're not trying to convince people out of taking a pay rise or something, which is it's important, but like it's not everything. But the people who are super scared of this thing and the people who are super scared of the vaccine, this is much deeper than than for those people. This is much deeper than than ten dollars an hour versus eleven dollars an hour. Well, so and it's interesting that you that you say that people that are, are scared of a lot of this. So for me, as, as, as a personal note, um, we are finding that I am actually very sensitive to a lot of medications. Um, I don't know if you've been following up on my stuff going on, but like they've been having to prescribe different medications for um, degenerating bones and things. And come to find out I have a mutation in my liver that basically it's um, doesn't break down certain things properly. Um, and so that's something to consider, right, for me and as a person. And I'm like, okay, so, you know, these vaccines that I've gotten throughout my life, um, if they metabolize through the liver or anything like that, if they go through the liver, they don't um, disperse correctly. And so it's something that people, at least in my case, you know, we have to consider a lot of the time what we're putting into our bodies. And this is only a new revelation for me um, because I've had some really wonky side effects lately. Um, 
And so, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. People like in my, like in my situation, which I'm, I'm very fortunate to where I get to, you know, work from home. I get to kind of, you know, we own our own business. We own our own photography business. And now I've started a bull house. And so I'm very fortunate in that aspect. But um, my original career was in medicine. And I personally could not, I couldn't go back to work. I would be, I would be terrified. I'm not going to lie. I would be completely terrified with all of this because of how my body reacts to things. And I mean, heck, the strep throat puts me down for a week. So, you know, there, there are, um, different instances where I get concerned for a lot of people that, you know, need to take care of their family while also having to live in this world now. Um, it, it's very, it's very unusual. It, I don't know how we get around it and how we get through it, but I hope, I mean, it, you're right. It's, it, I think it is going to be net worse than 1970s. Like I'm looking at like 1929, like, you know, the fourth turn, like we've talked about before. And, um, you know, we're, if, if we're in that, if we're in that era, you know, if, if, I don't know if you've read the fourth turn or seen anything about it. Have you? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Oh, goodness. Um, so the fourth turn talks about, you know, there's, there's, uh, 20 year sections of turns, right? And, um, right now we're in the, um, last final, like the fourth turn, which is the last 20 years of these cycles, a cyclical event. Um, and so according to that, we'd have like seven years left of this crisis, um, turn before it would become kind of better. And I mean, this was, um, oh man. Yeah. I will, I will send you that. You'll, you'll, you'll find that very fascinating. Um, cause you like patterns like I do. So, um, yeah, we, I do have a question from YouTube, um, asking what the CPI is for the UK market. Do you have that on hand? Um, I mean, I can Google it, but I, it, oh. it, infl <laughs> inflation, inflation is up here. It's, it's up everywhere. Right. Um, uh yeah i don't know what oh no it's it's not as bad it's 2.5 at the moment it's not as bad but um i think there's definitely inflation in the pipeline here and i'm 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 even a bit concerned that they might be missing something in the inflation here because on a day I, i'm not one to to try and gauge inflation myself from my day-to-day -day experiences but um i mean the the price of a beer has gone up here two pounds one pound fifty something like that it's very striking oh, um okay. And there are labor shortages. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe it hasn't hit here as fast. I, I, we, def, we didn't get the, um, so we didn't get the used car um, thing here because um, different dynamics in a sense. We have um, uh, better transport infrastructure in a sense um, than, than the U.S. does. And uh, so Europe hasn't been hit with the used car craziness as far as I know. But, um, and the rent thing shouldn't, I mean, in theory, it shouldn't hit here as bad because we spoke about it last time that we had these huge amounts of people um, leave the UK and go back to Europe. So we don't, um, I'd say the rent market right now is very, very soft, um, uh, as is the housing market here. So um, we haven't seen those two things. But as I said, ultimately, these transient inflationary pressures aren't that relevant in a sense, it's all about wages. It's always all about wages and inflation. And, and, and that's, look, the labor shortages are here, the labor shortages are in the US. And I can't prove 100% that I'm right, that this has to do with fear, vaccine mandates, which haven't come in yet. And I don't think they're going to do them here, actually. But um, I, I'm pretty sure it's that it's it seems so logical and it's what you just said like I mean if if people are concerned about their health which people on all sides of this are the vaccine people are concerned about their health the the people who are very fearful of COVID are concerned about their health everyone's concerned about their health everyone has different ideas of what it is but they're all concerned about their health that's going to override any monetary consideration it's 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 so obvious to me um, oh yeah the only, the only emotion more powerful than greed is fear. There's no doubt about that. And we've seen that in spades since the pandemic started. So, like, fear is always going to override greed. Fear is, like, the primal, you know, thing to dictate people's decisions. So I just, the more I think about this, the more I think we're just storing up a bit of a disaster. And I don't really see what we're going to, to do about it. 
And it's a lot more important than anything the Federal Reserve is doing. <laughs> oh, gosh. I mean, because, I mean, have you... On Tuesday, I, I would, if you can, if you're awake, I know it's super late for you, or at least on Wednesday, if you'll rewatch it. Um, I have somebody coming on. They're actually doing a takeover for the podcast. Um, and they talk about the Federal Reserve and how we have not done anything with our debt ceiling and how our uh, government, never all of our governing bodies are kind of still out on recess. And it's, um, if, if no one's really paying attention to the Treasury and what's kind of about to happen, it's looking a little shaky. Like, you know, I, I would hope that we wouldn't like default on any kind of debt. I don't care if it's if it's minuscule or just regular, whatever. But as a nation, that has never happened. Um, and the fact that you know these dates are approaching and they're still out on recess. Um, what do you what do you make of that? Like, I I don't think the U.S. is ever going to default. I, I I'm not sure they're even. There was talk last time. This thing rolls around every couple of years and uh i i've seen legal arguments to the effect that the u.s isn't able to default it's not legal um and really? there's a mil- yeah yeah I, there's a million different different ways to get around <laughs> it um there was a suggestion a few years ago that was completely wild it was wild but it's it, i looked into it it's totally doable to mint a platinum coin did you ever hear about this i've heard about it yeah, mint the coin. Mint the coin. Uh, it's legal. It's legal as far as I can tell. It's crazy. It's a crazy thing to do. But um, if you're face down with default versus some bizarre legal loophole, um, yeah, you could you could mint the coin if you wanted. I mean, I always thought they should do kind of a giant one and have two uh, Chinook helicopters, you know, bring it down the mall in D.C. I thought it would be very amusing. <laughs> But <laughs> even if it's just a tiny little coin, although since it'll be worth a trillion dollars, I don't know exactly what you do with it. You'd have to put it. Uh, you'd have to put it somewhere pretty safe, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you probably want to melt it down soon after you'd uh, you've done the entry on the balance sheet. But there's there's a bunch of different. The, the the default thing is just it's it's all it's all political in the U.S. because the the countries can default, but it's only countries that don't use their own currency. If you issue your own currency, you can't. There's no. There's no economic reason that you have to default. Um, so I'd be very. I mean, te- yeah, technically the U.S. could default, but the other question is, if they actually did default, would the markets even believe it? And no one. <laughs> we <laughs> don't. We don't know. No one's serious. If if they defaulted, so let's say that like one day everyone's holding um, treasuries. You know, everyone's got treasuries in their portfolio. And one day the U.S. comes out and says, we're defaulting. I mean, the first question will be defaulting on what? All your debt? You're not defaulting on all your debt. Surely not. Oh, you're defaulting on new issues since two months ago. Okay, well, what does that mean for like two months worth of issues versus the entire treasury market is like a drop in the ocean? So you got to think about it. And also the thing is, if imagine in a worst case scenario where they did actually default fully on all the debt. And I... I can't really imagine that happening. But then what happens when you when you go into a default process with bonds? Then you negotiate. You know, you it's what happened in Europe a few years ago when they had to do the haircuts and all this kind of thing. And you say, well, we can't afford paying you uh, a, a dollar on a dollar on the bonds, but we can pay you eighty cents on the dollar. Um, but what would that even look like? Because when they were doing that in Greece, Greece doesn't have its own currency, right? It uses the euro. So, like, Greece literally didn't have the money to pay back. So they had to enter into the negotiation process and negotiate a haircut for the bondholders. But what would that be in the U.S.? You'd be like, well, how much can you afford? Well, we can afford to pay it all. So why don't you pay it all? Oh, because we defaulted due to some political thing in Congress. It's just weird. It it doesn't. So I I can't even that, I can't even game it out. You know. That that then ask I'm gonna ask this question. Um. So with the some of these institutions shorting the bond market, when isn't that what they're kind of expecting then? Uh no no there's a there's a lot of different reasons that you'd short bonds. Um you'd short so you'd go short bonds if you thought that there was going to be inflation, for example. If you're worried about inflation, you could short bonds because then you're like then you're betting on a on an interest rate rise from the Fed, 
And if the Fed could go through with the interest rate rise, the bonds will fall in value. So I, I'd, if I was managing a portfolio and I was going to short bonds, that's why that's why I'd be doing it. I'd be doing it on, on as an inflation call. You'd be you'd be betting on inflation effectively. People have been doing that in Japan for a long time. It's been called the uh, the trade is called the widow maker because <laughs> they've never won. Oh no! It's called the widow maker. Uh, if you go and you short the uh, Japanese bond market, and there were a few people doing it because Japan obviously has something like two hundred and twenty percent debt debt to GDP. It's never defaulted because they've got a yen. But um, they, they, a lot of the people, it was misunderstood. People were all saying, oh, they're betting the Japanese government's going to default, and that's why they're shorting the bonds. I think a lot of them were, were, were betting on inflation returning to normal in Japan. For those who don't know, Japan has had deflation for about 30 years. So there, there are different reasons um, uh, uh, for shorting, shorting debt. If I was shorting government debt, it would be a, a, an inflation call, which, by the way, since we've just talked about it, probably wouldn't be a terrible bet. <laughs> No. Well, and that's, that's, you know, a couple of days ago or yesterday or so I tweeted out even like at the beginning of this year, they're like, no, no, we won't see inflation. Inflation doesn't exist. And they're like, well, we might see some inflation, but it should be okay. And then they're like, well, we might be reporting twice what we actually thought we'd be seeing. And I'm going, just keep kicking it. Just keep, you know, because like our here in Florida, you know, when I, when I track it, simple inflation right you you go with your staples you know your gas your milk bread eggs simple things that everybody buys right and for us our gas one has gone up almost a dollar which is extremely weird where i live to see gas go up that fast um our milk has gone up almost two dollars a gallon um and eggs are up like a dollar dollar fifteen for some reason um so you know, it's uh, it's getting kind of interesting to uh, go to the grocery store because you know what what you know we spent two hundred fifty three hundred bucks would cover an entire month. That might take you know two weeks now. It it covers like two weeks for a family of five. Um, so it's um, I don't I don't know how UK is how UK's prices are or anything if any, or if anyone else wants to chime in wherever you're at in the world like um it's getting a little crazy around here and I live you know being in Florida like I live in a cheap state like our our cost of living is really not that bad given where we live uh and I have people in the Midwest saying like their gas prices are a dollar more than ours I have people out west going you know I'm paying 5 bucks plus for gas and I'm going Okay, so that's that's that. So that in, you know the gas prices. Why why I say this, guys, is that um, if gas prices goes up, that's more expensive to deliver goods because the the companies have to allocate for that as well. If I'm right, Philip, how I'm understanding everything in the broad market. Yeah, for sure. Goes. And do you know who else is if uh, if oil price if energy prices rise? Do you know who's going to get absolutely soaked? Airlines. Airlines, yep. airlines are completely dependent on relatively low gas prices, and of course, airlines have had have had a horrible eighteen months, as we all know. <laughs> it, it, you're right. I look. I I'm increasingly fearful that we're going to see a, a serious upturn in structural inflation, and it's not going to go away, and that the 2020s are going to be a really, really rough decade economically. I, I really think this, and. Uh, I I haven't fully digested what exactly to do about it. As I said, I only really got back on the inflation stuff in the past week or two. Um, I, oh I was, no! <laughs> I was focused. I was focused on other on other stuff. But the the you know the labor shortages have obviously been talked about for a little while, and I kind of just um I kind of I kind of ignored them to be honest. But uh, but looking back into them, I was just like. I, no, honestly, because I thought I thought <laughs> the moment I heard it, I just said, "Oh, it's just reopening. This happens every time there's a recession. The economy re- opens back up, and there's a skills mis- mis- mismatch, right? There's a there's a mismatch." Um, and I thought that that was it, and that's a completely temporary thing. It's just everyone has to get sorted back out, you know. Uh, it's like a moving house or something, but um, it's not. I don't think it is. So yeah, I I don't know. I mean, it could be it could be a pretty pretty chaotic decade, really looks that way anyway back to the roaring 20s right but in a very different no way. i think more like, i think more like the 70s but with some characteristics of the 20s so we have all the stock market craziness and we have the junk bond stuff that we talked about before we have all this mm-hmm. crazy stuff in markets because like the 20s 
but it, it's much more feeling like the 70s in terms of um, the economic dynamics underlying it. The, the, the 20s were a good time to be alive. The 70s, I'm not saying it's a terrible time to be alive. Most, most, <laughs> most of our parents grew up in the 70s. Questionable, <laughs> questionable fashion choices. But, um, and for, hey, I mean, I, I like the bell bottoms. They're, they're really do you know fancy. the bell bottoms the kids are wearing them over here in London? So, and by the way, this is the center of Anglo fashion. So you will soon be seeing bell bottoms on the streets. Of Thank Miami. goodness, because you know these these ankle hugger pants that are so tight. You know, I just I never got into them. You know. Well, I, <laughs> bell bottoms, bell bottoms are, are a decadent fashion trend, in my opinion. But all the kids, all the teenagers, are walking around here wearing, and they're wearing hippie clothes too. I think they've realized. Oh yeah. They realized before I did that we're going back to the seventies. So they obviously have a better uh, instinctual Maybe. economic understanding. If if we if we can have a tinfoil thought here, yeah. um, maybe the fashion trends we need to start watching those because they seem to be ahead of the curve of which decade we'll be in financially. Uh, there, uh, there, <laughs> I I am perfectly open to it. My my wife has made more money buying and selling Nike sneakers than I've made in the in the market. So, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird world these days. I, I'm probably exaggerating slightly there, but there does seem to be some interesting stuff in the fashion world that uh, I don't understand. But um, but yeah, the kids are definitely wearing bell bottoms. So that that is coming to the U.S. I guarantee it because every every style, you know, like hipsterism, everything started mm-hmm. here and it ends up in it'll start in Brooklyn and it'll seep out into the rest of the country from Brooklyn. So um, you've been warned. But if you're if you're fans <laughs> of the bell bottoms. <laughs> about it but anyways on, on a serious note the, the i mean the 70s uh yeah i look it's it's the 70s it, wa- it wasn't the end of the world you know no no one no one's gonna starve to death or anything like that i hope <laughs> but um it's it's gonna be pretty rough and investment wise the 70s were one of the worst decades to be an investor the inflate inflation is really nasty on stocks and there's not many places to, that you can really go um it's it's hard it's hard anyone with savings who's trying to invest those savings typically has a very hard time in an inflation um so yeah buckle up i guess i mean maybe maybe everything gets back to normal vaccine mandates peter out when when companies realize that they can't afford to lose 10 to 15 percent of their thing maybe people maybe as vaccination rates tick up people get a little bit less fearful and everything like that and we get back to normal in a year but i don't know i don't that wouldn't be my base case scenario as economists say no i this is where i like i i guess i'm happy that i do live in places like you know that get hit by hurricanes and natural disasters it's a really bad thing to say but it prepares you for stuff like this because you know we have you know Actually, I don't know, Philip, if you saw it. I posted a picture. Uh, so we went to Sam's uh, a couple months ago, and we had bought some toilet paper. Guys, I'm not I'm not taking chances this winter on the toilet paper shortage here in, in the States. I don't know, Philip, if you guys had a toilet paper shortage um, during COVID last year. Yeah, I, or- was- I ordered I ordered <laughs> Chinese toilet paper. It's funny, actually. I ordered Chinese toilet paper off Amazon because there was no toilet paper. And they sent... They sent these <laughs> tiny little rolls that were like the size of like smaller than a Coke can. You know what oh, I mean? No. They were like, you know, those mini Coke cans that they give you on airplanes. Yeah. They were like that size. And I was like, what, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do with this? You just use the whole roll. <laughs> I, 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 I was completely mystified. It's like land of the giants or something. It was very strange. So yes, we did have toilet paper shortages. We had, short, we had very yes. bad shortages at the beginning of this. Oh jeez, that is. I'm sorry. I just it, I cannot help but laugh. Like it's just the weirdest. I don't know who decided the toilet paper thing. Whoever whoever decided it, you know. I hope you had some kind of investment in the companies, because <laughs> um, the uh, demand was very high. But anyway, so I we went to Sam's a few months ago, and I've you know been kind of stockpiling our our house for the winter time, uh, and so we have a. Um, the first package, right, on the bottom, there's a picture on my Twitter, um, and it has, you know, the normal size rolls with the same packaging and everything that we've been getting for a few years now. And then we have the new one on top that is, like, 40 or 50 sheets less per roll, and it was a dollar more. 
and it's like the package is shrink and uh, we're, you know, this kind of goes along the line. It's um, shrinkflation is what they're dubbing the term. I don't know if that's a made up term at this point because, you know, they're, everyone's coming out with really weird. No, there's a, um, in England, there's a shrinkflation index that you can look at. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, cause I saw it in like, I was trying to research all this and like, I saw shrinkflation. I was like, that cannot be a real word, but okay. It's a real word. Um, well, it's a, it's a horrible word made up by economists who can't speak English <laughs> properly, but it is, it is, a, it's a thing. It hasn't just been made up last week. Um, yeah. They have an index for it in, in the UK. Funny. Well, so, well, cause like everybody had been reporting on um, cereal boxes, you know, this happened back in 08 and 10 when they, they shrank the package they kept the the um, front facing side the same size, but when you turned it, it was actually skinnier. Um, and they're starting to do that again. People are just finding it in cereal boxes and pastas and uh, different uh, packaging all around the the various grocery stores. So the fact that I'll have to find the tweet, but. Um, I have it in my garage at this very moment, seeing the differences and a dollar more between the two. I'm like, wait a minute. This so, so, right. so the interesting thing about the shrinkflation thing is p- people have been claiming it um, uh, for years, really, that, that this was going on. And I've no doubt it, it sometimes goes on. But we never um, we never had a ha- have had a sustained inflation while the shrinkflation narrative has been around. So if we do get an inflation this decade, a uh, se- severe one, a sustained one. It'll be very interesting to see if the shrinkflation actually is a is a large large thing. So, in theory, if shrinkflation is a, a component of inflation, then what should happen is when inflation picks up, in shrinkflation should increase. And so, since we have a, a an index with the UK, I can't remember who puts it together. I think it's the ONS or it might be the Bank of England. Um, we can we can watch it. So that'll be an interesting one. That that's a that's a testable hypothesis, right? So if if shrinkflation is going to is going it increases with the CPI, um, then it, then what you're saying will be true. But I would say that people have been saying for years that shrinkflation was a thing, that they are hiding the real inflation in the shrinkflation and blah blah blah. And I've always been a little a little cautious about it but hey i'm open to i'm open to we're going to get smaller things that are more expensive and it's just going to exacerbate the uh the inflation the way it'll work by the way if people are interested is as i say inflation is all about wages and if wages go up and prices the, the companies have to put prices up to maintain their profit margin um another way to maintain your profit margin if you're seeing it cut into by higher wages is to shrink the product so that's the way companies make those decisions. If anyone's interested, um, that yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, I put the uh, tweet up in the nest if you wanted to click on it, to sh- so I could show you what I was talking about. Like, um, but I mean, no, that, that's they're they've been talking about it. Like, and there's articles all about it lately about you know, them having to cut back on resources or, you know, shrink down um, how much they're giving out in each, you know, product or whatever. And Couldn't they at least keep the price the same? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's, I think that was my biggest grievance. So it's like, okay, yeah, I understand that resources, like we are in a big scarcity for resources at this point, um, you know, production and um, ability to harvest and whatnot different materials but I mean the fact that not only are you shrinking down how much is in a product but you're also raising the cost like it's it's just asinine at this point I I, I, I don't know maybe I expect like a big like you walk into the store you walk into Costco or Sam's or Walmart and it's like warning warning everything's smaller but more expensive you know what I mean so like you know because if Thankfully, we're okay, you know, we're okay when we go to the store, but like, you know, you think of families on fixed incomes, like they're used to, okay, we can get this and this and this and this, and it's going to cost this amount. And then they go in and all of a sudden it's two, three times the amount. What, what inflation does really well and what you're expressing has been known for a long time is it undermines confidence in the system. There's a famous quote from, uh, from Lenin. Uh, and he said the best way to uh, destroy the capitalist system is by debasing its currency. There's a lot of truth to it. Inflations are 
very dispiriting and demoralizing. And uh, when people see the phenomenon that you're talking about, they feel like they're being scammed fundamentally. They feel like they're, they're, they've been sold a lemon by a dodgy used car dealer. And that's what inflation does. It's, it's, it's a very insidious thing. As you say, people on fixed incomes now, usually not on 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 handouts or something like that because they'll be pegged to CPI. But yeah, it's it's often the I th- I think the people who are going to suffer most in if the twenty twenties turn out to be inflationary and if the stuff we were talking about last time is true and markets are as crazy as they look, the people that are going to get hit hardest by this are going to be retirees. There's no doubt about it. Because they're they're on a real fixed uh, uh, they're on a real fixed um, thing. They don't have CPI plus. They don't have uh, wage indexing um, that other people have. Um, and the other thing, the thing that we didn't really refer to it last time, but um, it's kind of it's relevant here, is that if the markets are as overvalued as they look, and I think they are, I, I don't think it's really debatable that they are. Returns moving forward. For the average pension fund or endowment, looks set to be extremely low. Um, I've seen pretty credible estimates putting them at basically if money invested today in a standard 60/40 portfolio, which is what you know you can basically say that that's what most pension funds and endowments are. I mean, they obviously mess with it, but at the end of the day, 60/40 is a reasonable way to think about them. I, I, I last time I checked, returns on a 60/40. If you put your money in one today. Is something like minus one percent, or at least it's close to zero. Um, so that's nuts. That means, and remember that these these pension funds are usually expecting about six percent real, so six percent plus CPI, so around eight nine percent returns a year. So in order, so they're assuming eight nine percent nominal returns a year, and if then they turn around and markets come down and everything like that at some point, then they're looking at zero. <laughs> effectively or not because they're not investing everything now they're looking at vastly reduced returns of maybe you know four percent three percent and then on top of that prices could be rising that's going to be really really hard on retirees yeah and that's a big reason my parents are with me (laughs) um i i do think we'll start seeing you know multi-generational housing uh it's a it's an interesting phenomenon that goes out on in hawaii and a lot of other places but the only place i've ever lived um where multiple generations live under one roof um and i mean we're talking three four generations out there and so and right now in our home we have three generations and i think it's going to become a common thing because you figure they're their retirement, you know, we were middle class growing up and um, their retirement's not enough to live on, especially with rent and stuff, how that's going and housing. And it's it's insane. It's a completely insane. Well, Europe, Europe has had multi-generational households for a long time, not the United Kingdom, but mainland Europe um, because of the heavy unemployment. Really? Yeah, because of the heavy unemployment. If you go to Spain, Spain's had 20 percent unemployment for 20 20 years ouch yeah 20 30 years and it's you go over there and it's not the parents living with the kids it's the kids living with the parents so they tend to have multi-generation households um i uh, it goes on another tangent really but i i i I don't know i mean a multi-generation household system could actually be quite nice one one thing we've learned from the pandemic for sure is that uh old folks homes are not where you want to be Mm. right i uh, and i could never do that i could never like i'm I, I'm, I'm medically trained and i'm like i i can care for you better than those people <laughs> not that not that my parents need health care in that sense they're you know in their 60s but no 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 I no i i know I, I i i was i was woke to the uh to the health care th- to the to the old folks home things before the pandemic but i think the pandemic thing has really shown it for what it is so in that sense it could be quite good but I, What's happened in Europe now? It would it would be happening if you're talking about it in the U.S. and in the Anglo sphere. It will be happening for different reasons, as you say. It will be happening because the the retirees can't, uh, don't have enough money, but not the kids. But um, in Spain and stuff, I do get a very strong impression that the multi generational household living thing accounts to a very large extent for the very very low birth rates there, relative to other countries. All Western countries have low birth rates. U.S. is slightly better than the rest. Ireland and the U.S. used to be the leaders, apart from Israel. Israel has high birth rates, nowhere else does. But um, 
I'm talking about relative, even within that, Spain had those multi-generational countries in, the, in, in Europe tended to have even lower birth rates. Um, um, so I don't know. I, that, that is a whole different, that's a whole different thing. I've, I've done quite a lot of work on that, the demographics hmm. issue. And, and the demographics issue is the, is the big long-term time bomb that's probably coming down the pipeline in the next two decades, to be honest. And that is going to be inflationary as heck, really. It's, it's, it's quite, it's quite bad to think through, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I, I think your instinct is probably right. If it's going to be that rough on retirees in the next decade, multi-generational households might at least alleviate that a little bit, but I hope it doesn't further diminish the the birth rate. Although it could work both ways, right? Because in Spain, the, the ki- they're not having kids because the young person's unemployed and they're living with their parents and they, they don't grow up effectively. But here, I guess you could make the case that it's the parents kind of mooching off the, the young people, in which case that means you have free childcare, right? I mean, my grandmother helped raise me. It was very useful when my mom was working. So that would make that yeah. that would actually that could actually be very that could be a very useful way of um of encouraging getting the birth rate of having having elderly people care for children seems to me like a very economical use of of resources and it's also good it's better than it's better than having the state uh, child care what you'd much prefer your parents to look after your kids than than a rando right oh well i mean yeah like that's um yeah <laughs> I I try not to be the helicopter parent, but since she is our one and only <laughs> for our daughter, because um, we can't have any more, yeah, I'm pretty protective <laughs> who watches her. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's just that's just me. I'm I'm finicky about that, I guess. Uh, Philip, do you have time for a couple questions if people want to come up and ask you stuff? Um, yeah, like twenty minutes or whatever. Minutes. Okay, so if there is anyone that wants to come up and ask Philip a question, um, just request to speak and I'll bring you up one at a time. Um, if not, we'll sit here and just keep yammering on about <laughs> inflation. And um, I guess m- my thing while we wait is uh, what can the uh, federal governments do all around the world to help curb it, I guess, because you can't prevent it at this point. It's not preventable. Um, but just curb it. They need to, first of all, start realizing that um, the policies that they're pursuing in the pandemic have massive economic ramifications that could easily turn out to not be worse than, than maybe the virus or whatever, but they could they could really damage the economy in such a way that it, it becomes self-defeating in a sense. So I think, I think just getting to the point where they start trying to balance the priorities a little bit might be a good thing. Um, in terms of everything else, I don't know. As you say, it's all in the pipeline now. But I, I, I like where you're going with stuff like multi generational households and talking about how that could work for childcare and stuff like that. I, I think, I think you, it, there's going to have to be a lot smarter policies in the future than just kind of like the old ones of you know shovel money at this and that. And I think they're going to have, have to be a lot smarter in the future, probably. Or, or pro- maybe they won't because governments don't seem very confident to me, and they'll just they'll just screw it all up. But you know, seems like a, a good bet. Yeah, I would say so. I would say so. Um, hey, Supreme, what's going on? Um, so earlier, Philip mentioned that he, be- uh, based off what he's seeing, that he believes uh, the ma- uh, I don't know if he said the majority of the unemployed is probably because they are or not the unemployed, the people that are unwilling to go back to work is because they are scared of the um, virus. Um, So based off what he's seen, has he seen any information that people are just like too comfortable, I guess, laying on the couch and being at home and whatever, um, so they don't want to go back to work? Yeah, so well, that's the alternative explanation that they've been given relatively nice welfare benefits, and then they've kind of stayed home. And if that were the case, that's what that's what everyone's saying at the moment. I mean, that's what the newspapers are telling. That's what the Wall Street Journal is saying, and so on. And look, it might be true, but I I just I I don't. We've we've had we've seen 
other countries and we've had loads of experiments where one state will raise its its um its welfare benefits relative to another state and does that cause that kind of unemployment i just think often it doesn't and i think like when you go and you look i'm not saying that there aren't people who just don't want to go to work there are probably people who just don't want to go to work and they've been effectively off work for a year and as you say they've been lying around the couch i know i get it i'm sure people some people are being a bit lazy but when you look at the polls of of the fear the fear component of covid there are definitely five to ten percent of people who are genuinely terrified and and i was talking to a few people about this this week and i said can you think in your own circle of of your of your extended family and your friends of people who have been so scared that they haven't left the house or that they've left the house in a ver- on a very limited basis and i can count the amount of people that i know like that on one hand but there's four or five you know and so i don't know that many people so it seems like it's a real thing um and those people unless something changes drastically it seems to me logical that they must have they must have dropped out of the labor force unless they're able to work from home but it's not like some of those so the main shortages we're seeing at the moment are in the service sector obviously and people see it when they go to restaurants and so on because of the disaster those those there's going to be as many of those 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 people who are that scared in the services industry as there's going to be in any other industry so i i just think it's a it's a logical explanation i can't prove it and the article i wrote um which i'm as i said shopping around to a variety of places and i'll see if anyone publishes it says that economists and psychologists need to work together and they need to study this problem they need to put out surveys and they need to investigate it so i i can't prove it until that happens but and i don't have the resources to do it obviously i don't i don't work for a university I'm not an academic um but that they should do this 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 they should do this um because i think it's a better explanation than the lazy one again not saying that there's no one that isn't just being lazy there probably is but but um but if i'm right it's going to be a lot more of a difficult problem to solve and Philip, if I can add on to that too. So, and and yeah, being here in the States, like I, I know I see all that about, you know, oh, no one's wanting to go to work because they've been off for so long. But at the end of the day, human nature is to have a purpose. Um, that is, that's what we're built and designed to do is always to have a purpose, whether it's, you know, caring for our family or going to work and having a job or anything of that sense, really, because, you know, um, they idea is you know you're happiest when you're in service to others that's literally a psychological thing um that we have and i can't i can't see it being a full thing of people don't want to be self-reliant i i I couldn't imagine being so reliant on you know government aid and just you know especially with how our government system is and you know oh yeah they're gonna do a stimulus check and it's like spongebob nine weeks later, they're still going to do a stimulus check. Like, you know, I, that uncertainty would cause so much anxiety. I think I could be so way off key on this, but, um, you know, they've messed with the unemployment, the, you know, 300 extra here, or the, you know, 1500 stimulus there or whatever. It's, um, a little daunting so i don't i don't know i hope it's not people just be, being reliant on it because that would be it would be sad because that, that can actually increase the depression rates and that's not a good thing um anthony jackson asks didn't philip have some thoughts on the fed oh yeah i think we were supposed to talk about the fed <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on the Fed. Um, <laughs> uh, it might take a while. It might take a while to get to go through. Uh, uh, it may. How about this? Kind of. Why don't you uh, ask me the most relevant thing about the Fed, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about it for five minutes. The most relevant thing about. Oh man. Um, I'm sorry. I'm putting you on the spot. I'll come up with something um, if you want, but it's better if somebody asks. Yeah, I want I want your hot topic. You're the thing that really just gets under your skin because i think i love when you get okay sweet. okay so <laughs> so the problem okay so last time we talked about the reason that we were going to talk about the fed this time was because last time we talked about how 
a lot of the craziness in the market is is due to Federal Reserve policy, right? And then I think we were going to therefore say, well, why do the Fed behave in the way that they do, right? So I suppose I'll try and keep it brief. But um, the thing about the Fed is that it is not doing what it was originally supposed to be doing. This always happens with, with institutions and especially with government institutions. Um the Fed was originally set up in response to the 1907 uh, crash. It was a, a small financial crisis, a banking crisis in the U.S. And what the Fed was just supposed to be was a lender of last resort. They just wanted to make sure that the banking system didn't collapse. And so if you go and you bank with Bank of America or TD or whatever, you'll see on it that you have an um, – what's it called? An FO, FOIC guarantee on your, on, your, on your savings, and that's a good thing to have. It means that if the bank fails – the Fed will return your money to you. And that gives people confidence in the banking system. It prevents bank runs. It prevents people from losing their shirt. If the bank makes a stupid decision, it's a good thing. Having, having a lender of last resort is a good thing. And it was a good thing to, to, to set up for. Um, but since then, the Fed has become something else. And basically what it's become is what people now recognize it for today, which is that they, they try and use interest rate policy, monetary policy, to try and control inflation and employment. And I just think this is not a good idea for a number of reasons. The first reason is I don't think it works. I don't think that the interest rate actually steers the economy. Now, within extremes, it can. So, for example, when there was a lot of inflation in the late 1970s, the Fed jacked up interest rates to like 18 percent, crazy numbers. And that caused a recession. So the Fed can create recessions. There's no doubt about that. If they jack up the interest rate enough, usually if they invert the yield curve, it's called when they, they get short term rate higher than the long long term rate, that will often be enough to tip the economy into a recession. The Fed is able to create recessions. I do not deny that. Um, and is creating a recession uh, the right response to inflation? I don't know. Maybe sometimes it is. Maybe sometimes it isn't. I think definitely some of their interventions in the past two decades have been a little extreme on that front. I don't know how you justify turfing people out of their jobs to because CPI is 2.8 rather than 2.1. Uh, I don't know, but whatever. Um, what, what I don't think works is lowering rates to spur economic activity. I just I don't think there's any evidence that this works. I think what happens when they start juicing rates and they start bringing them down is you get a lot of activity in the financial markets. Lowering rates tends to drive the financial markets a little bonkers. And some of it's rational. It's because it's because, you know, if, if you lower the, the interest rate, all the other interest rates tend to come down with it. And that means you have lower returns on those assets. So you have to go and get higher yielding assets and so on. But I think a lot of it's just psychological. People Fed watch in the markets. I've always found it a bit infuriating, but they do. And they sit around and they go, what's the Fed saying? What's the Fed saying? What's the Fed saying? And they tend to act on the basis of Fed pronouncements. And usually that acting is just piling money into crap. And I think this is basically the effect that the Fed's employ their, their, uh, their monetary policy has. I think, the, I think what it does is it really screws up financial markets. It creates bubbles. We've, so, for example, inflation targeting, as it's currently practiced, basically came into um, into being. It started in the in with the Volcker shock in seventy eight or seventy nine or whenever it was, and but it developed into an idea in the nineteen nineties, effectively. And this is the same time as we saw the beginning of the of the up down zigzag financial markets craziness. So we got the dot com first, then we got the housing bubble. Now we've got the everything bubble, whatever. So the Fed policy is just making markets super volatile. Um, so I just don't think that they should be doing any of this. I, I wrote a read an essay. Um, it's called Monetary Fate. If anyone wants to Google it, it's a, it's a technical economic essay, so it might not be that interesting. But I think that they should be parking the interest rate at a fair at a fair disbursement. So we assume we. We, we the interest rate is effectively say you know, it's like the savings account in your bank, right? It's the free interest rate that you get without investing cash holdings. I think they should just be parking that at a fair rate that we say, you know, that's a fair rate to give savers. 
And I think they should kind of leave it there. If there was an extreme inflation scenario and nothing else was working and the Fed said, we're going to do a Volcker shock again, we're going to jack interest rates way up and we're going to try and get this inflation under control. Maybe, maybe. In that situation, maybe. It's a prudential decision. But this constant FOMC meetings coming out, going in front of the television, getting everyone excited, all the people on the television going fed, 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 fed. This is, it's, it's a clown show in my opinion. And it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not good for the economy. It's awful for markets. It's such a toxic thing for markets. And I, I wish they'd just stop, but that's why they do it. Um, and the other, the other issue is what, what's also happened with the Fed on a more institutional basis is I'm not joking when I say the Federal Reserve has become a jobs program for e- academic economists. Academic economists who don't want to go and work in financial markets because it's it's sleazy or whatever, they go and they go there and they're allowed to do their pure academic research as if they're at a tenured university position. And some of the research that the Fed does is great, don't get me wrong. Most of it's not. And so they've they they've the whole people don't understand how in a sense corrupted the economics profession has become due to the existence of these giant central banks especially the fed because the bank of england here it's just one place down on threadneedle street and they've only got one staff the fed has branches everywhere you've got the san louis fed you've got the boston fed you've got the new york fed you've got the richmond fed and they're all staffed so like it's this giant jobs programs for economists so like the economists who are the ones who design fed policy who are the ones that might be able to criticize the Fed, are completely corrupted because they're all hired by, well, they're not all hired by the Fed, but it's like a jobs program for them. So the issues the issues with the Fed are really deep, but um, that's what I think they should do. Now, they're never going to listen to me, and they're never going to listen to people who beat up on the Fed, so you have no power or whatever. But I guess from the point of view of people listening to it, that's that's why we are in the position that we're in that it's been a complete mission creep as they call it when it happens in foreign policy they've got their hands on more and more bits of the kitchen and they don't want to give it up and they they i'd say they enjoy the power and the prestige and it's a jobs program for economists but they sit around and they pretend that lowering interest rates increases fixed investment it doesn't there's no evidence for that run the regressions it doesn't do it it doesn't do it. And whatever you say about them, the, the academic economists that work at the Fed are pretty smart and they're perfectly able to run a regression on uh, interest rates and fixed investment. And they'll be perfectly able to see what I've seen when I do it. I can do it in 10 minutes um, and it shows no relationship. So they and they all know deep down that they're juicing the markets, but they won't say it. And so the whole thing's it's kind of it's very corrupt and it's a little bit of a scam. Kind of said it better myself. I mean, that's why that's why I enjoy listening to you, Philip, is because it's like you know, one, there's no filters. It's just here it is. This is how I see it, and you know, you call it out a hundred percent of the time. Like it's what we see with what our government's doing is just ridiculous. And no, they probably will never listen to us. <laughs> They probably will never listen to us until, you know, it's it's finally our, our generation's turn to finally get in there and say, okay, how do we fix all this? How do we fix centuries of BS going on here? Um, but I think I think we're on to something, though, Phil. You know, the, the communication aspect, at least between the populace around the world, right? We can at least agree on that. Like, if we make enough noise... Um, I think we can we can definitely enable change. Do you think the the Fed the Fed thing isn't a political thing? It's not like there's loads of it's not a it's not a left or right. It's not a political thing. It's a it's a purely it's a technocratic issue. It's it's just like I'd say most of the Fed economists are right of center. Will be my guess because economics tends to be right of center. It's I guess right. The Bernanke was a was a New Keynesian probably a slightly left of center person uh yellen was a new keynesian slightly left of center powell is i don't know he's just a dude i don't know i i don't think he has a i don't think he's ideological um greenspan was famously a republican um i don't think this is a left i don't think that's re- the fed is a is a political issue it's it's an issue very specific to the economics profession the economics profession took over the fed 
um, in beginning probably around World War II, uh, definitely in the 1960s under Kennedy and so on. The economics profession took over the Fed and they turned it into their own baby to line up with the theories that they'd been discussing since the early 20th century. And they are heavily invested in that. And it's really not the poli- I mean, the politicians could technically do, do something about the Fed in a sense, they possibly. But the, what needs to happen if the Fed is going to change its mind is all the academic economists are going to have to change their mind. And it's, it's a different type of problem. It's just a different, it's a different type of problem than what people are used to thinking about with, with government and with all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what I'd say. So economists need to, need to become more honest about what the Fed can and can't do with themselves. Um, and they, but they're not incentivized. The economists are always the ones who talk about incentives and they're not incentivized to do that because their students are going and working for the Fed. That's the problem. Well, Philip, you've definitely given me some things to think about and I'm going to, I'm going to look in more to like the different CPIs because I know they have been using, um, like different ingredients i can't my brain is shot after this past week i'm so sorry um but different factors they've been using different factors into the cpi calculations um every year at least here um from what we found um so i might get back to you here in the next few days uh trying to figure out the factors they used you know for 2020 2019 2018 to see you know the cpi data for that compared to and if i can find all that and compare it to now and see maybe we can get like a true cpi type number do you think um cpi is always going to be how you cut it you can construct alternative cpis and stuff i i i mean that's basically what i did in my in my blog post i thought it was reconstructed mm-hmm. cpi i've done it loads of times the cpi is uh is 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 not as as crooked as the people who want to make it out to be crooked think it is but it um no no inflation index is going to capture every aspect of inflation um it's just not um it, it, constructing inflation indices is really difficult because they make um what are called hedonic inju- adjustments which means uh they adjust for the the increase in quality so the you know you have a flat screen television now there's clearly an increase in quality over over the giant thing that you'd see in the 1950s that probably gave you brain cancer or whatever um and so like there's a quality (laughs) increase there so they try and adjust for these and so it's a really difficult thing inflation indices are a really different difficult thing but i think i think if you're interested in it you can you can keep an eye on the key ones which is cpi and then there's cpi x food um cpi x food energy cpi x this x that but right now there's nothing going on that that is being masked by any particular CPI construction is what I'd say. The CPI is showing relatively high inflation, 5%, and people can go, oh, well, 5% doesn't sound high enough because my eggs have gone up 25%. That's true Mm -hmm. because eggs are only one part of the basket. Um, CPI is never going to promise you to tell you everything in that regard. But I think the fact that you're you're seeing your eggs go up, whatever, 20, 25 percent and the CPI is unusually high at five percent. I think it's kind of doing its job. I think I think we should give yeah. credit where credit's due. 100 percent. 100 percent. Well, I appreciate your time and it's I will always welcome you back because you just it's a wonderful thing to hear, especially, you know, having, you know, being able to communicate across the world like this. I think it's it's very fascinating. It's always fun um I, I i am on the job market at the moment but uh it, it, ping me or something in in a couple of weeks and if i'm not if i'm not busy i'll i'll gladly do it again for sure for sure um so guys that ends today's uh little segment with philip uh and i hope you guys enjoyed it and uh go phil if you haven't yet followed him go do so because um it's just, he'll blow your mind every time i did post his essay um, I found it, I quick Google search, posted it up in the nest real quick. If you guys want to go click on that so you can kind of bookmark that and read it, uh, when you have a chance, I'm also going to tweet it out and put it in the description. Actually, no, I did tweet it out. Sorry. Um, and put it in the YouTube description as well. So, um, again, Philip, thank you. And I will see you around. Thanks very much. Have a good weekend.